Uh, Megan, thanks again for being here. Uh, you gave me a thumbs up. And again, I, um, I, I noticed the aura ring and we talked about this in our first yes. connection. Uh, you know, why that comes up to me is I got to notice this morning on my aura ring that I check every morning. It's the first, I don't look at my phone, except I, the only thing I do every morning is before I check my phone is I, I, I check my, my aura status, I guess, whatever the hell you want to call it. And this year it popped up like, oh, you've been a member for four and a half years. I was like, holy shit. It's pretty, wow. It's pretty cool. I, I talk about it all the time. I, I, it is the only thing that I now know I don't want to live without. Um, the, aura, the aura ring has been, well, yeah, that's a pretty heavy statement. I should say the only wearable device that I now know today that I don't want to live without. Um, wow. It's, it's, they should sponsor you. <laughs> they should sponsor me. I have reached out to them. But you know what? <laughs> Hello, aura folks out there. Four and, right? a half, four and a half years, lifetime member. I ain't going anywhere. I keep this is my second, or uh, yeah, I think it's my second. This one's smashed up too, so it's time to go to a third one. Um, well, and you've got a really cool story that I think that they would love to sell, which is that you use it as your wedding band too. Yes, I, I don't know. I, I I guess I I never realized that that's that's unique. I never really thought of it that way, right? Um, so yeah, or of folks out there, hello, knock knock knock, right? <laughs> Um, actually, you know what, Megan, I want to ask this. You and I talked about this in our earlier conversation. You were talking about your husband who, um, doesn't take his off. Like he, he works out with it. And remember anything we talked about, did, did, did you ever, did you ever dig into that? Does his, I take it off to, to work because I don't want to get smashed up and yet it still gets scratched and dented and stuff. Did you learn anything? Like his is pretty durable. Okay. So since our last conversation, his broke now, <laughs> okay. it did not. It did not break in a way, though, that I attribute it to the fact that he wears it to work out. I think uh, it stopped charging. So um, to Aura's credit, though, they asked very few questions and just sent him a replacement. Okay. And a caveat to him wearing it when he works out that I think is an, is an important caveat to mention is he primarily is a runner. So there's not a lot of like impact on the ring while he's working out. He does wear it when he lifts, but he doesn't lift very frequently these days. He's mostly running. Okay, so thank you. So that adds clarity, right? Because I, I'm, I'm a, I like chin ups and stuff. I like bars, right? And, yeah. Um. So I'm always, you know, jumping and to my detriment. Sometimes I, I, oh, I broke two feet because of it. That's a different conversation. But, um, <laughs> you know, so I always attribute like that smashing of the ring, and yeah. I, I you know I wear it outside even when we're outside doing doing stuff and in gloves on. But you still see that it gets it's you can't see it, but it's all dinged and banged and. Again, folks, or or folks out there, durability is there. I'm like your biggest fan and advocate, so shut the hell up and yeah. hop on board. And you know, I will also tell you, Jonathan, since the last time we talked, I joined Orange Theory. Uh, do you guys? Right. Have yeah, that yeah, yeah. Long? We have Orange Theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So I've joined Orange Theory, um, and I'm still wearing my Aura ring while I'm doing the rowing mm. and the and the lifting. Mm. But I do wear um, Orange Theory's gloves. So, and the like, even though they're, you know, weightlifting gloves or whatever, it does cover the actual part of the ring. Mine's a little bit scratched, but so far so good. And Orange Theory also has their own wearable device that monitors their, can I, I could, yeah. curiosity question. And this is, uh, do, do you notice similarities, gaps between the data that each show? Um, so the Orange Theory wearable, um, it goes like around your arm okay, and it's exclusively a heart rate monitor and it tracks what heart rate zone you're in and it displays it up on the screen while you're doing the workout because the way the coaches um direct the workout is like they tell you what heart rate zone they want you to be in so you have to look at the monitor to see if you're in the right zone got it so um aura doesn't really as you know of course doesn't really work that way yeah, yeah. so um it's not really apples to apples got it or will you know because aura you know senses when you're doing an activity so it does ask me after I've done a class, like, hey, were you just doing hit? Oh, hey, were you just doing yes, rowing? Yes, 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 yes. But, but beyond that, the- But that's not their stuff. thing, right? This is what I talk about. Like, it's, 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 if, if, that's your, if that's your flavor, then Aura Ring is not suited for that, right? Yeah. That's not their, that's not their thing. I, I use the Aura Ring because of the, the miraculous data that it produ produces to me first thing in the morning um, to-, to truthfully confirmation bias of how I feel right like you yeah. know I'll wake up and one of the first things I'll say to myself is like what does my body need this morning because I have a variety of morning habits and rituals and and sort of processes or routines whatever you, whatever framework you want to use but you know I'll say that and like okay what does my body need and then you know the confirmation bias is like oh shit you know my HRV is phenomenal today this is great <laughs> right or holy shit my my you know uh, my resting heart rate is is that Great. We, we all know our own baselines, right? I'm, a, I'm, you know, I'm in optimal. 
I, I feel optimal. Maybe I don't feel optimal, but my body is telling me something different. So what does that really mean? And you, you kind of jockey that back and forth. Anyways, holy shit, I'm supposed to have a conversation with you and all I'm doing is talking about aura and promoting aura. <laughs> so aura folks out there, 416-717-4139 is how you can connect with me. Uh, Megan Shapiro, connect with her because she's got great stories to share about this too. Anyways, um, Megan, thanks for letting me pivot through that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I think, you know, from our last conversation, I'm happy to talk about the aura ring all day too. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I, I was going to ask you to talk about something tremendously unique to you. And I think I just absolutely covered it. I mean, that's, that. there's a connection that uh, the, the moment that uh, you and I connected first, I, I think it was you that identified that or, or whatever. It was like, holy shit, is that an aura ring? I was like, yeah. And there's already that bond. Like, oh, you're an aura user? Like, let's, <laughs> you know, it's like all, all, automatically. So, <sighs> thank you. You're here today because of a wonderful connection, Erica, that led to a, a great conversation that just continually blossoms. And this is the thing, folks. It's like our net worth of who we are as human beings is our network of people that we connect to and 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 megan thank you for sharing space because uh, you know our futures together are bright and we keep finding ourselves in, in in similar orbits and you know for me it's about people we're on this earth yes. and we're human beings first that's everything i believe in that's the work i do today i think that's what connects us together even you know, our first conversation was like, I'm finding a real raw and authentic. And, 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 you know, the beautiful part is so are you, right? That's what I love yeah. about it. So when you hear the words, put people first, what shows up for you? Ooh, well, I can't help but immediately associate that with sort of my primary career, which uh, I'm a construction attorney for those who uh, probably don't know. Uh, and so I've been representing construction companies for probably like 15 years. And the, the reason I've stuck with it for that long is because I really feel like I get the opportunity to fight the fight to really help my clients and protect them, whether that's defending claims that are being made against them or helping them prosecute their own claims you know, for payment or you know, mechanics liens issues or things like that. And so I, I feel like when I hear people first, that's what I immediately think of. Like the images that pop into my head are the faces of all of my clients that I've been working with, you know, over the years, because that's really what keeps me going. That's what drives me every day. So uh, look, I'm curious, how do you even get into that? Right. I mean, construction law, we're going to come in and out of this throughout this conversation, but construction law. I mean, I, I hear that and I've lived it, gone through it. Um, it's awful at times, right? I mean, I can remember there was even, you know, every job that goes through litigation is like, oh yeah, we're going to sue you. All right, we'll see you in court for like seven to 10 years because that's what it yeah. takes, right? It's just, it's ridiculous. But how do you even get into this? Like, did you know at some point in life that like, this is what I want to do? Not at all. Uh, so I like to say that I sort of fell into construction law and then fell in love with construction law. Okay. So I started like a lot of people, I went to law school thinking like, oh, I'm going to be a district attorney or a public defender, right? Because I, I grew up on law and order, I, you know, all of those sort of wonderful legal dramas that are all over our TVs, thinking that's all that there really was. But I knew that I wanted to be in a courtroom doing trial work. And the best way to do that is the criminal side of things as opposed to the civil side of things. Uh, but I graduated law school in 2009, and we all know what the U.S. economy was doing in 2009. And so none of the district attorney's offices or public defender's offices were hiring, despite the fact that I was actually interning at our Sacramento County District Attorney's Office at the time that I graduated. So I pivoted, and I decided to start looking into civil litigation because it's still at least uh, lawsuits and courtrooms, even though most civil lawsuits settle not as many trial opportunities, but at least still in a, in the courtroom area. So about two years into practice, uh, my current firm was hiring at the time. Mm -hmm. And when I started here, they had a much smaller construction practice at the time. And they the, the partners back then didn't really view it with much high esteem. And so they kind of used it as the training ground for new attorneys. So as the new attorney that had just come into the firm, they were sort of like, all right, here you go. Uh, you can you can do this thing. And we essentially had like one or two clients and it was mostly defending defect litigation actions. And so the more senior attorneys. In the hold on, hold on. Pump the brakes. What does that mean? Defending detail, uh, defect 
unpack that. Yeah, so uh, allegations that the, so we mostly represented subcontractors. So allegations that our subcontractors work was defective or bad or not Got performing. <laughs> okay. Right, up Thank to you. standard. So then they would be, the homeowners would sue the GC or developer, and then the GC or developer would bring the subcontractors into that lawsuit. Sounds pretty common so far. Keep going. Yeah, exactly, right? But um, because it, it's it happens so much, particularly with tract housing here in California anyway, um, the, the partners at the time felt like it was a super easy thing to do. The phrase they used to use was like, a monkey could do it. So they were just like, whatever, nobody wants to really do it, so we'll give it to the new person who comes in every time. Sure. But I got really lucky because at the same time I came in, our concrete subcontractor hired a new general manager. Like, I think we were about a month apart. It, it was really right there at the same time. And when he got hired, he came in and was sort of looking at their company's P&L statement and was like, man, we're spending kind of a lot of money on legal. I want to personally dig into this and wrap my head around it and see what's going on. Mm. So he and I sort of looked at each other and said, like, well, I don't I, I don't really know what they used to do, the attorney before me and whoever was before you that was handling it on your side. So let's make this what we want to make this. And I really give him a ton of credit here because we really built our own system and way of navigating not only defect litigation, but ultimately that ballooned and blossomed to the point where I realized not only do I love concrete, concrete has my heart. I, I uncovered a previously unknown love of concrete itself. Uh, but I also loved the area of law and what an impact I could really, what I could really have. I could really make a difference for my clients. And so I went to the partners and I said, I know how you guys view this. I disagree with you. I think there's a ton of room for really heavy strategy here. If you really dig in and really learn the nuances and the intricacies of construction of construction law. And I'm interested in doing that. So I want to take ownership of this. It no longer has to be like the redheaded stepchild that gets passed down to the new attorneys. Mm -hmm. I'm going to own it and I'm going to grow the practice. And at the time they were basically like, okay, fine. And then one of the partners pulled me aside later and said, we'll support you, but I'm just letting you know, you're probably limiting your growth here by do by making this choice. Ooh. Okay. So know, what, right? what happens next? Well, what happens next is I wish I had my virtual background. What happens next is my name's actually on the wall now, same firm. But uh, so some of those other partners left. Uh, so I grew the practice. And uh, now that's like 95% of what I do. I represent GCs, subs, um, some material suppliers, mostly subs, but I've got a, some owners too, uh, but mostly subs. And I have a, a, an entire system that I've put in place. I have had decades long relationships with my clients. That concrete sub is still my client. That GM is still the GM. We still have the same system that we put in place years ago that we developed together. I've now replicated that with my other clients. Can we pump and, the brakes a little bit here? Yeah. Um, Sorry, I could talk a lot, Jonathan. No, I love that. <laughs> and this is what's so super exciting. And I want to you know, share as much as you can share openly, but I want to, and I want to talk about that relationship that, you know, is a decade deep or more, especially with this concrete um, organization that, you know, you caught me and I didn't want to inter interrupt because you had such a beautiful pathway there, except, you know, you talk about something that's unorthodox and unique. And I think this is what makes you who you are in the space that you're in, especially for me is when you talk about the GM of the concrete organization, you're like, Hang on a second. You know, the philosophy and ideologies of, of legal. You know, the, the, here's where I'm going with this. And my brain is not necessarily processing this. But yet in construction, most times it's like, shit, we spend a shit ton of money on, on litigation. Yeah, but, you know, it just gets wrapped, wrapped into over. That's, it, it's assumed, and I hate this word, and I hate the word hate. Uh, this is awful, right? It, it's assumed <laughs> that it, it becomes, you know, part of the game. Yet you dis you 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 dissected it differently and you continue because I know who you are as a human being or, or the, the much, the part that I do know. How do you have that conversation with him? And like, what happens? What do you guys, what do you guys actually decide to say, we're doing this differently? What does that mean? So for his company, that looked a couple of different ways. Sure. The primary way that that looked was we took a really somewhat unorthodox approach that increased their attorney fees in the short term but ultimately resulted in a longer term strategy that increased their profits in other ways as a result. And I'm not being intentionally vague. I'm just setting the table. By that, what I mean is oftentimes most subcontractors who are brought into this kind of lawsuit will immediately tender the claim to their insurance carrier. 
as they should most of the time, because that's why they have insurance. They're paying premiums for a reason. They should receive the benefits of those policies. Mm -hmm. With this particular client, though, we made the sh we made the decision to be incredibly strategic about which cases we tender to insurance and which cases they paid for me as personal counsel out of pocket to handle. Okay. So that's that was that short term increase in attorney fees, right? Because now they're paying for me to do something that otherwise they wouldn't have to pay for because insurance would cover it. The benefits long term and how it ultimately resulted in increasing profits in other ways is that we were able to work really closely with the broker to make those strategic determinations about which cases we were going to tender, which resulted in a better loss run, which allowed them to ultimately qualify for better policies with better premiums. And combined with the fact that in California, the statute of limitations on defect claims is 10 years. And so we've got a 10 year look back period where we could be defending claims for homes that were completed 10 years ago. Right. So within that period of time, um, the U.S. insurance market anyway, in the mid 2000s, it went crazy. And so a lot of insurance policies switched to what's called an SIR, which is a self-insured retention which is different than a deductible. So most policies have what's called a deductible, mm -hmm. and that's an amount of money that you know of, know ahead of time. And as soon as you get a claim, once you tender it to insurance, you pay that amount of money in advance, then insurance appoints an attorney and they handle the case. Right. An SIR, on the other hand, is the opposite. So whatever the number is for the SIR, and they're usually much larger than a deductible. So this particular client, they range from 25,000 to 75,000. Okay. And what that meant was they had to spend that amount of money out of pocket on me or someone like me before insurance ever had an obligation to actually take over. Hang on. So that, hang, meant, hang on, hang on, that hang on. meant that in some cases, like the, they were going to automatically have to spend $75,000 out of pocket before insurance kicked in anyway. And I could usually settle a case for far less than that, including my attorney fees. Okay. 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 So right, that, following. yeah, that happens. So uh, what you're suggesting that, that happens more times, there's SIR comes in and you know, there's a range 25 to 70, yeah. whatever the, the range is um, before it even goes to insurance. So you're saying if you proactively take an approach, we can mitigate the losses. You don't have to spend 75. You can spend, I don't know, 30, 40, 50, even if you spend 50, you're still, it's still less. you're still ahead. <laughs> Yeah, that's exactly it. So that was that was one approach that we took that was sort of like we're going to deal we're going to take an, a different customized approach to how we want to handle this litigation. That was one way was strategic insurance tenders. Okay. Uh, the other way was to your point, as you just said, we really dug in deep on figuring out what we could do on a proactive basis from the beginning of even the contract negotiation phase when they were entering into new master agreements with you know the big home builders because they do mostly tract housing. So when they would enter a new master agreements, we would be really strategic and intentional about the red lines and the markups on those contracts so that we could prepare ahead of time, knowing because of the culture in the state of California, almost every new home, if it's not custom, if it's part of tract housing, it's going to get it's going to be involved in a class action construction defect lawsuit. That's just the culture here. So knowing that piece of information, we could plan ahead of time and put ourselves in the best possible position once that lawsuit inevitably came. Wow. I didn't know that statistic that most situations end up in some sort of legal litigation. C can you I'm probably to be fair, I'm probably being a little bit over dramatic with that. Okay, but I, you, obviously there's biases there that suggest that that happens more times than not. Yeah, definitely okay. more times than not. So, so are you able to unpack some of what that means when you talk about, okay, so we can redline the contract to prepare ourselves to be pro. I love the word proactive. So can, can you unpack that a little bit? Like either an example or a metaphor or something that lands? What do you mean? Yeah. So uh, I'm a huge proponent of being proactive in all areas of risk management for construction companies. Yeah. So I can give you lots of examples in lots of different areas for construction companies with this particular case, when we're talking about how to be proactive in the face of what I'm going to call inevitable impending litigation and claims that are coming down the line, sure. what I mean by that is when you're in that negotiation phase, that contract negotiation phase, you can look at specific clauses in that contract that you might have the negotiation power and sway and leverage to be able to tailor and craft to be a little bit more favorable to you. For example, usually an indemnity and a defense uh, clause are, there's going to be some room for interpretation and some room for adjustment and tweaking. Another way you can do that is um, 
if the project happens to be subject to an OSIP, an owner controlled insurance policy, which is where they're basically privatizing the insurance for this particular project. And then they get to determine what the deductible is based on your scope of work. And so that's always negotiable. I mean, I, I say that's always negotiable. Whether they'll agree to it is a different question, but it's always worth pushing back on. If they say, oh, as a matter of, we just, as a matter of course, our company always charges a $75,000 OSIP deductible. If you did the foundation, then you can be pushing back on that. And you can see that's absurd because foundations very, very rarely fail. And so I think that our deductible should be more like 10,000 or whatever. That's just an example, right? So that's another way you can do it. Um, one other way that you can be proactive is if you are using your own sub-tier subcontractor, keeping sticking with the concrete example, if you're responsible for finish grading before you actually install the foundation, then the finish grader would be your sub-tier subcontractor. Then you can pass down a lot of the risk that you're assuming vis-a-vis -vis your con subcontract with the GC or the developer, you can pass that risk down to your sub-tier subcontractor in the form of making sure that you've got strong defense and indemnity language that requires them to defend and indemnify you for any claims that might arise as a result of this of the finished grade work. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, and there's still lots of questions. Uh, yeah. Parts of that <laughs> make sense, and again, I'm, I, uh, my legal background is is not not very extensive. So, what what I am gathering is there's a lot of information, and and what's buzzing through my head is that. People don't know what they don't know, yep. right? Yeah, I call them risk blind spots. Okay, so like you're talking about something very different. You're talking about proactively managing and mitigating risk, which is much of the work you do today, which in my mind, my mind's eye right now, which is very different than even the even the construction world I'm used to, which is like, okay, here's a standard. Truthfully, here's a standardized contract. It's written in, it's written in a legal manner that hopefully we never have to execute. And if we do, uh, fuck shit's gonna hit the fan anyways, right? So, but you're talking about something very different. It, it it's like a partnership from the onset to say, hang on, folks, let's co-construct this reality. Let's co-construct these. It's almost like every contract you enter into, if, if so if I'm the concrete guy, every contract I enter into, I'm going to flip it over to Megan. Take a look at this. You're going to put your insight on it and there's a, there, there's a cost associated to it and a value. Sure. But now what's happening too is you're setting the boundaries and expectations of your clients and vendors because now I'm holding them to higher standards saying, okay, Mr. Client, any client, here's, you can issue me whatever con because that's what happens. Like, I mean, in the general contracting world, general rights, the, the, the general's liability is all passed down to the subs and the subs, yeah. what, do, what do the subs do? Most times blindly sign contracts because they just don't know or, yep. or don't have time, energy or resources. Right. Whereas yep. I'd rather proactively engage somebody like yourself to say, I don't know shit about this. What do you know? And now all of a yeah. sudden, now all of a sudden I'm, I'm also setting the standard for, for the, to the GC to say, this is our protocols. You're in or out. Yeah, absolutely. And um, the one tweak that I would say to your uh, summary of, of sort of how I how I handle this with my clients is I don't want this to be some sort of uh, self-feeding funnel to continue to feed me billable hour work as an attorney, yeah. right? So I really do try to give that knowledge and pass that knowledge along to my clients, at least for the stuff that is like kind of standard that mm -hmm. we, that we mm -hmm. see all the time. So I give them the tools to know these are the things you're looking for. This is red flag language. This is, and then these are the red lines and markups you should be proposing. These are the tips and tricks on how to negotiate that and get it through because you're going to be more successful if you're doing it yourself before you actually bump it up to the attorney and the attorney gets involved because now their attorney is going to be involved and now it's attorney versus attorney. You're going to have more success if you're still in that phase of like uh, contract manager to contract manager, whoever is responsible for negotiating those things. So I really do try to sort of pass a skill set along to my clients so that they don't need me. I it's it's a terrible business plan, but I always like to say that with proactive risk management, what I'm trying to do is like if I'm wearing two hats, right? If I've got my proactive risk management hat and my construction attorney hat, I'm trying to make make myself obsolete. If I do a good job training you on how to 
look at proactive risk management within your construction company, then you'll never need me as an attorney or you'll need me far less because some, some lawsuits are inevitable, but you'll need me far less. And so my goal is to empower you as a construction leader to really learn those things, internalize those things, develop system strategies and blueprints for proactive risk management strategies within your own company so that you don't need to use a construction attorney as much. So that way you're not spending a bunch of money every single time a new contract comes across your desk or every single time you're considering acquiring another company or uh, you want to implement or supplement a new documentation policy within the business. This is beautiful, right? Um, for so many, so many different reasons, but what showed up for me is, is you're actually injecting what it is to be a human being and you're putting people first again by training and educating them to say, listen, construction manager, to construction manager, I want you to show up like a human being and have a, a real conversation and say, listen, Jonathan, this is going to work or it's not. And how are you doing that? You're identifying, you're giving them, you know, Megan's notes, right? To say, look for the following phrases, flags, tip, trick, whatever it is, so that you don't need to pick up the phone. And it's not that I don't want to hear your voice. I'd love to hear your voice. But, you know, and this is, this is so interesting because this is like, this this beats the narrative, beats down the narrative of like, holy shit, every, construction. Every time you hear the word litigation, you're just like, oh, all I can hear is, is we're never going to go to court because it's going to cost everybody too much money. So let's just settle out of court anyways. But nobody does that because what happens is, is egos get in the way and you want to battle it out first and see yep. who's see who's going to who's going to wave the white flag for for it goes on for 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 months, years. And then somebody finally says, OK, we, 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 we've blown enough money collectively. Like, what's it going to take to settle? But never mind that. Put the fine. It's it's the physiological and psychological stresses and anxieties and unrealized profits along the way that just beat us down and you know keep businesses from thriving. And then it comes to you know come into orbit w w with a wonderful human being like yourself. And I've heard you say something to the effect of excuse, and excuse my ignorance here and, and for the gas for you know. It gets down to training. You, you know, I, I think you've said something along the lines of, "I, I, I want to be your shield and not your litigation lawyer," or, or something to that regard. Basically saying, "I, I don't want to be in court for you. I'd rather teach you how to stay out of court." Yeah, I want to be your shield and not your sword. There you go. Yeah. Right. You know, so, 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 tell me yes. a little bit. Tell us yes, a little bit more absolutely. about what that means to you. Uh, so I sort of think about it like this. Um, a shield is very protective, right? And that's honestly, that's the part I love about being an attorney the most. Like it triggers that sort of like almost that mama bear instinct of like, don't fuck with my cubs. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so I love that part of it. Um, and, and, and when you're in a litigation situation, oftentimes it requires a little bit of the shield, but mostly the sword. Of course. Right. Which is like, I'm, I'm going to fuck you up. Right. And yes. there's value in that. And that certainly is the attitude that I, bring to every actual lawsuit that my clients get involved in. But to your point about the psychological toll that it takes, I think that a lot of people underestimate that, particularly if they have been fortunate enough not to have been involved in a lawsuit that drug on for years. I mean, like I, I've had not to, not to digress too far and go on too much of a tangents, but I've had, I had a client where we were involved in a particularly uh, nasty high stakes construction lawsuit that went on for probably close to four years. And I would get 3 a.m. emails from him of just like, I cannot sleep. I am stressing about this. I'm worrying about this. And right. And like, it takes a huge toll. And I hate that too. Right. Like I can sit there and say to him, don't worry. Like we're in a good position. Don't worry. I've got you. Like, but that's easy for me to say. It's not my business that I built from the ground up in my twenties. Yeah. And now I'm close to retirement. Right. And so I hate that for them. And so as much as I will be right there in front of them with that shield and sword protecting them when I have to, I would much rather empower them with the tools themselves to try to avoid getting into that situation in the first place. And that's where, if you see my logo, actually, it's right, I don't know if you can see it. It's kind of a compass with a shield inside yeah. of, or a shield and compass inside of it. That's where the compass comes in. I like to, I, I like to give you the, I want to navigate for you, help you navigate through the areas of risk within your company so that you can create your own blueprint to avoid as much as possible getting into these situations so that I don't have to use the shield as much. I love it because, you know, anybody who's, I, I've been through, through litigations and they're awful. And, you know, what I learned out of it is that I don't ever want to experience that. There was, you know, one job that 
it took us seven years to get to court, but it, it was longer. It was nine years because we had to wait for the job to to to, to um, get completed. Couldn't walk off the job. It was delay claim, and all it became was just like a battle of 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 egos and and truthfully, like whose dick is bigger. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna I love your words. I'm gonna fuck you up. And every time somebody said something, it was like send an email, follow up with a letter. So you got to send this email fax because we were still, you know, you, you, it, everything had to be documented three different times. And then it was like four or five books of, of, of discoveries that were, you know, 500 to a thousand pages each. And, you know, you're going through and holy shit, it's exhausting. Yeah. Holy shit, it's exhausting. So then, you you know, you, I, I, I love what you talk about is that when we have to get to that point, we will, but let's not get to that point. So now you spend much of your time educating folks, right? Like, uh, tell us about this vision because this was what, what was tremendously unique. Is you know, when I first had conversations with you, it was like, whoa, hang on a second. Your livelihood is legal litigation in the construction law, which most people cringe about. I'm like, fuck. Except that you've made it tremendously exciting by again, proactively educating folks, which you've unpacked a little bit. I think there's a bigger vision because you've also, you know, created um, courses and programs and I don't want to steal your thunder. So I want to pivot this right over. Like tell, tell our audience how this came to be, where we're at today, what the vision is. Like there's, there's, it's a heavy questions. So go. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, so it started out again with doing this with my actual law firm clients, right? Like going like, okay, what do we need to do ahead of time to make sure we can reduce the number of lawsuits that you actually are are getting getting pulled into each year? That was really the genesis of it all. And then probably about a year and a half ago, I was like, light bulb. Um, this is th this this system that that I've created here, this proactive risk management system, and the framework that goes along with it is it could help a lot more construction leaders. I don't have, it doesn't have to just be my law firm clients. This can really help anybody, right? Uh, it's not trade specific. It's not subcontractor versus GC specific. And since it doesn't focus on the law part of things, it's not state law specific. So it can really help anybody who is willing to sort of uh, recognize the value of implementing a proactive risk management strategy. And so once I had that realization, I was like, okay, well then how do I, get the message out. How can I help the most number of construction leaders? And I thought it through and I did some research and I gamed it out with my, you know, my, my Vistage group and, and sort of tried to the best way to do that was an online self-study course that is, uh, it's currently available. It's eight modules. It applies my framework, which is called AIM for Higher Profits. That stands for assess, integrate, and monitor. And each of the modules in the online course takes you through a different area within your business that can be bolstered with a proactive risk management approach. And then each module has what I call the mini blueprint that walks you through that three-step frame, that three-part framework. So it asks you the questions to assess and find and identify and uncover your risk blind spots in that area. It helps you then through guided questions, identify a potential proactive risk management policy that you can implement within the business. And that's the integrate. And then the monitor part is that continuous improvement element, which is how do we implement this system within the team? How do we get team buy-in? And how do we continue to monitor and improve the system once we've got it in place and tweak as we go? And so um, I created the online course with construction leaders in mind, knowing uh, how busy they are, at least <laughs> what I know about my own clients, I figure they're not unique, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a self-study course. It is, the videos are very bite-sized and easy to consume. So I think the longest video is like 16 minutes. I also offer audio only, so that way you can listen on the go. There's only one module that requires you to actually watch the video because it has visuals that go along with it. And that's the contract module because I'm, sh I'm literally on the screen going through different uh, versions of specific key contractual provisions. But there is an audio for that too. So you can listen and then come back and pick and choose what you want to do. And then by the end of it, once you get through the end of the eight modules, you put all eight of those little mini blueprints together and you have a master proactive risk management blueprint that you can then apply on, in your company. So that's out there and available. But what I found is that oftentimes leaders would prefer if they're real, if they really truly see the value, 
-hmm. They would prefer to do this collaboratively. Sure. And so, um, and I love that too, right? Because again, to go back, to get back to like why I like doing this, it's the, it's the people aspect for me. I actually like building those relationships and creating that, that bond with people. I want to feel like I'm helping somebody. It's great that the online course is out there, but I don't get any like emotional boost from that. Yeah, yeah, you know? of course, of course. Sorry, what was that? No, I, I'm agreeing with that. I'm going, yeah, I, I got oh, that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, um, but because there's a need, so, and a, and a desire, I'll also do the exact same training, but I'll come and do it in person. And it usually takes the form of two full day trainings. They're about a month apart. The first one I'll come out and I'll meet with sort of like ownership C-suite level. We'll do that assess phase together. We'll go through your current business. We'll identify and uncover risk blind spots together. We'll do the first half of the integrate which is we will then start to put together the framework and the outline of what we think the proactive risk management blueprint is going to look like. Then I come back and I put it all together. I, I build it and I create it. And then, you know, we work together offline um, in that interim to really dial it in. And then day two, when I come back is usually superintendents, project managers, and foremen. And that's the sort of train the trainers, right? So that's like, okay, here's the new system that the company is going to, uh, is going to be implementing. I want to get your buy-in. I want to get your investment. I'm going to teach you the system and then I'm going to teach you how to teach your field guys the system. Because at the end of the day, the field is really one of your most valuable assets when it comes to a proactive risk management strategy. I'm a huge proponent of that. Um, and so they're kind of the most important piece. So I, I spent a lot of time in that second day focusing on them. So um, so that's the same system, though. It's that same framework, the same uh, areas, pillars of risk within the company. And then the final other way is I actually do one on one strategy sessions with construction leaders don't like the word coaching because I, when I hear coaching, I think of mindset stuff sure. and there's value in that, but that's just not what I do. Sure. Sure. I'm sure. all about actionable strategies. So, um, I, like I've got one client right now who's a COO of a mechanical company mm -hmm. and he wanted to do some one-on-one -on -one strategy sessions. So he hired me for a series of eight strategy sessions and we're digging into the specific things that he wants to dig into so that he can then take them back to his company. So I do that as well. Okay. There's a lot there. So thank yeah. you. Um, Okay, a couple of things that showed up for me. Something that triggered me when you talk about our field staff is, is very valuable. Hang out in that space for a second. What do you mean when it comes to proactive risk management? Unpack that a little bit. Okay, uh, so I think the field is important in like a lot of ways when it comes to proactive risk management. The way it shows up within what I do mm -hmm. is I think they're very, very valuable in terms of helping to uncover some of those risk blind spots. So one of the things that I do with my clients is I have um, I have an anonymized survey for your field guys that's already written for you that you can send to them. They you tell them it's anonymous so that they can feel comfortable being truly open and candid. And the information and insight that they can give you about where they see areas of risk is like mind blowing. It is things that never occurred to the guys that are just sitting at their computer all day. So that's one way that I give me an example. What do you mean? Uh, so if you send out this survey to the field and you say, uh, you know, whatever questions are on the survey, they might come back to you and say, yeah, you know what? A big problem that we see is that um, the foreman for, if let's stick with the subcontractor example, since that's what we've been using. Sure, sure. The foreman for the GC keeps coming out to me and 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 verbally telling me that I need to do this, do this thing a little bit differently than how I've been doing it. Okay. And I don't have any way of dealing with that in real time. Right. So that's a, that's a huge area of risk, right? Because should that be change order work? Should that be documented in some way? Should that be, should there be some pushback about whether that communication is going through the right channels, right? Like that's an area that you, now you need to unpack mm -hmm. and dig into, right? So that's an example. Um, another area that um, I love is for buy-in from the field, because particularly when it comes to documentation policies from a proactive risk management standpoint, which is arguably next to contracts, the single most important thing that I really give to companies that I work with is a robust documentation po policy procedure and practice. And by that, what I mean is to use the example I just talked about with the, the conversations that we all know happen in the field in real time, what are we doing to document that? And how are we making sure that that documentation then ends up in the job file? Because we all know an unfortunate reality of our industry is that there's a lot of high turnover. And mm -hmm. so the guy that may have had the conversation and maybe did the first right next step, which is sending that text message to confirm the conversation, right? Hey, just confirming the conversation we just had on the field where you told me blah, 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 right? Now you've got the text. So that's step one, good job. 
But if it stays on your phone and you leave the company and go somewhere else, and now two years later, there's a dispute about that change, we don't have access to that information anymore. So the next step is to having to have a documentation policy that everybody knows about, particularly the field guys, that is easy for them to do. It is not like an extra big thing that they got to, one more thing they've got to, one more task they have to handle, but that gets that text message into the job file. So that way, two, three years later, when the, when the lawsuit gets filed and your construction attorney says, I need all the communication related to this particular change, you now have it right there, whether the guy works with you or not. So you're, you're piggybacking the standard operating procedures from a legal perspective. You're saying, hey, folks, legally, you know, and, and this is this is some of the things that there's, there's pushback. It's like, well, why do you got to cover your ass all the time? And like, you're only doing that, you know, the minute you start doing stuff, like sometimes it, it, it sets off red flags to folks that are like, oh, is this job going to go to litigation? So how do you respond to that? Because that becomes heavy, right? It does. Uh, and I, I love this question because I've got a great response to that because I, I just did one of these trainings on Monday of this week and this came up. So I'm excited to talk about this question. The contract, that's your answer. Because if you actually take the time to read the contract page by page, beginning to end mm -hmm. as all 72 pages, and I know it's shitty, I know. But if you do that, if the person who owns the contract does that, not everybody needs to do that, right? But it, usually it's the PM who owns the contract. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whoever owns the contract, they read it from beginning to end. They're going to find nuggets of information that are in there that will help smooth those conversations. So, for example, what that looks like is this. There will probably be some language in the contract that says something along the lines of, a change is not effective unless it's signed by both parties, right? Mm. So if you're having those verbal conversations in the field, all your confirming text message or email needs to say is, hey, uh, pursuant to contract provision 13.3, just confirming the conversation that we had in the field. And then if you do get pushback, it can be verbally because then you don't, you've already got the confirming so you can have the conversation so that tone is there and you can just be like, hey, I'm just trying to protect us both, man. Like this is going to help us both. We're, it's keeping us both in compliance with the contract. Okay. okay. I don't think anything's can I happen, May I challenge not? this? Can I, can I challenge yeah, this? I love this. Absolutely. This is a real great example and real great conversation because I'm with you. There's a part of my brain that says, hell yeah, Megan, I'm in, I'm with you. And yet there's the, the, the other side of, of me that is very, you know, people oriented that that really stands up and says, well, fuck the contract. I don't give a shit what the contract says. We're going to deal with this. How do you respond to that? Because that happens a lot. We've all lived job sites where it's like, I don't give a shit what the contract says. Uh, so there are a couple of ways you can deal with that. My favorite way to deal with that is, like, if. well, let me ask a clarifying question. Sure. In your example, who's the one that's having that conversation? Well, let's just say this: it's the it's the person, the four person on the job, male or female, so running the job. You know, yeah. talking to a uh, either a site superintendent or you know, let's just say it's a, it's a subcontractor form and talking to the the site superintendent of the general. Okay, so then I would say the easiest, simplest way to to handle that is to move it up the chain. Sure. Because usually the PMs are having these conversations with each other anyway, because the PMs actually usually, in my experience, I'm not disagreeing with your personal experience. So if, if you have had a different experience, I that's totally valid. In my experience, usually the PMs don't give a shit about maintaining the relationship. They're all about protecting the contract and they're sending those emails that are pissing each other off all day. And they just don't care that they don't have a good relationship with each other. So that's a great, that's a great opportunity to send it up to them. The supers are usually the ones that are trying, again, in my experience, the supers are the ones that are more relationship based because they're people, people, mm -hmm. right? So they're the ones that are trying to maintain the relationship. So give them the easy out. Let them make the PM the bad guy because the PM on the other side is already going to be the bad guy too. The PMs are always the bad guys. Let the PMs be the bad guys. Let the supers be the good guys and just pit it, pit it that way. Well, this is cool because this is the work that I do is like, you know, the PMs okay. don't have to be the bad guys all the time. And then when you have a people to people connection and it's an end conversation with me. And I agree with you to say, listen, we have these deeper conversations and I've, you know, been in both situations where I've been, you know, on a job site and the PMs and the directors and, you know, the, I've been in all those positions. And I love what you said, because what illuminates for me is how do you pivot past that? You, you simply have the, the real raw conversation with the other PM and say, Hey, listen, dude, here's what the contract says. 32.2 article one, a says this. So in light of this, here's how we're going to respond. If you disagree, I don't have a problem disagreeing with you. Then let's just remove it right out of the contract, and let's have a yeah. let's have a human to human connection and say, okay, you know, uh, are, are we going to treat 
um, work orders where unless there's, because that happens too. Like that's the bullshit of the industry is like, oh, every work order has to get signed. Yeah. And you know what happened once they got, the site supers never gave a shit. They'd sign work orders blindly because it would always come down to, to the PMs and the people executing the jobs and say, well, you know, you spent a hundred grand in, in, in work orders. Yeah. Well, fuck you. I'm going to pay you 20. Well, you're, you're an asshole now. And so this gets back down to the proactive risk management. I love, thank you, Megan, for helping to co-create the reality of this. Um, I, I didn't really ask this question, so I'm, I, I don't want to make assumptions. I don't really like the word assumptions. How do you say, who is this best suited for? You know, I struggle with that question. Um, so I'm not surprised you have it too, because I struggle with it. Sure. I, I have intentionally said construction leaders because that because that's the best way to characterize who has shown up. So it's oftentimes owners, but but it's just as often C-suite or even if you have really um, not to beat a dead horse, but proactive minded supers and PMs yeah. who are really like they, they want to just they want to be really good at what they do and they want to they're willing to invest in that. Then it's them sometimes too, them individually saying, <laughs> hey, I, I, I'm willing to pay for this out of pocket for myself because I want this training for me because I want to show up the best version of me. I want to be the best PM I can be. I want to be the best superintendent I can be. So, but, but that's usually what it is. It's usually PMs, supers and above. Is yeah. And thank you for, you know, that's what shows again, my cognitive biases that I care for, you know, living the site world and the PM role and everything else I've done, abundance of things, right. It's different when it comes from this, from, from the leadership down cool, right. As a project manager, how did I learn construction law? Unfortunately, being in freaking litigations that were yep. shitty and terrible. And, you know, I, again, I'm a human to human person. I, I, my career has strived because of the human to human connection. And yet, you know, I don't know enough about law other than what I've learned through, through rough experiences, good and bad to know that this augments who I am as a human being is, is a project manager in that space or a project director, you know, educating a whole bunch of other PMs. Like, hey, listen up folks. You know, I love what you talk about the red flag. Hey, listen to this. And how does the conversation shift when, because I hated the fucking contracts, right? I, I, sh I shouldn't say I loved the actual contracts. I loved having the conversations about the scopes of work and going through it. You know, in, in Ontario, we have the CCDC 11s, right? And it was like, okay, this is all written. You know what I would do with that shit? Uh, it's legal bullshit that's, that, and, I, and I'm saying this open, it's legal bullshit that it's, it's heavy. And I never want to get to it because it's written in a way that we're going to get screwed anyways. Yeah. Right. So let's learn what we can learn. And now you're pivoting through because the general contractors con contracts were always really heavily in favor of the, of the GCs and good on them. That's what they pay lawyers to do. That's, that's what they pay the, the you know, the, the other versions of Megan to do is write this up so that we're, are, we're, we're protected. And, you know, you've embraced that and said, I want to educate other construction professionals so that we're having, um, better connected conversations and hopefully I use this word loosely too. Hopefully there's a, there's less animosity yeah. and greater understanding to say, dude, I'm doing this because the way this contract's written. So we have two choices. We can address the contract issues as the way they're written, or we can, you know, put in writing what we need to put in writing. And protect yourself. Yeah, it doesn't it's change. Recognize it doesn't, that it's not an act of aggression. It does not an act of aggression. It doesn't change the flow of the of, of the site. Yeah, it's simply it's another documentation, just like sending another email, right? Exactly. That's why I hate when people talk about using the contract as a weapon. Yeah. Like I don't know if you if yep. you've seen people talk about that. It drives me crazy because enforcing the contract. <laughs> <laughs> is not an act of aggression. It's everybody agreed that these are the rules of the game we're playing, right? That's like saying the referees in a football game are being aggressive when they call fouls. It's like, it's wild to me. I'm like, everybody agreed to this. Enforcing it is just doing business. Well, because people blindly sign contract. And I don't want to say, but sometimes they do blindly sign a contract because I, and it's just like, uh -huh. and then you walk in with this fucking document, you throw it on the table and like, this is what your contract says, Jonathan, you're going to do this. And I'm sitting there going, I don't give a shit what the contract says. Yeah. I don't. But a part of me is egotistically saying, I don't care because I want to connect with you to solve the issue. And I, I still need to respect that holistically, 
this document formed. I love what you say, the rules of engagement. Here's the boundaries and expectations of the game, right? This game is not infinite. It will end one day. So in order to have it conclude, here's the parameters. This is a, like, I love this because when most people hear construction contracts, it's like, right? You get tense and you're just like, excuse me, let's, let's, let's fight about it. And, and you're, you're, what you're, you're peeling back layers going, no, no, no. That's a choice or we can be proactive and we can have better conversations and learn from each other. So thank you for doing the work you do. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I, I love that you're in, in so um, different in, in, in the work you do where you educate people. Um, it's, it's, it warms my heart because it just, it's very different. And that's why we're, we're connected today and we'll continue to connect in the future. But, you know, for the, for the folks out there listening and watching and they're like, okay, I, I get what you're on to. If it hasn't yet hit them, you know, what are one or two or three things that are tremendously important that you think get overlooked that some folks might need to hear to, to I, I want to say this respectfully, but give them a beast thing to say, shit, we're not, assessing our risks enough uh if it's all right with you i'd like to answer that question with a story yeah i love to go on because i think it really illustrates and really brings home the point sure um okay so early in my career uh I, i'd been an attorney i'd been with the firm i've been a construction attorney for just a couple of years and because i had taken this ownership mentality that we talked about earlier over this area of practice the partners trusted me with a with a very big multi-million dollar change order dispute case for an electrical subcontractor that we were representing. It was a public works project. And uh, our our electrical subcontractor client <laughs> was so excited, right? Like I, I had a meeting set up at their office to go over and talk about, we were getting ready to draft the complaint to file the lawsuit. And so we were going to go over all of the documentation that they had to support the damages calculation that they had given me in terms of the amount of money in unpaid change orders that they were owed. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I'm reading over the contract to prepare for this meeting and I just get this like lump in, in my, in my stomach, right? It's like a, it's like a rock down there. So I drive over, I drive over to the company, I walk into their huge conference room and the owner and the project manager from the job are sitting at the table and the project manager is stoked. He's got his printout of his, of his like color coded multi-page spreadsheet. It's probably 20 pages with like line by line documenting every single change order that they were owed that had been unpaid mm -mm. to total up to show me the damages calculation so that I could take it back to the office and I could learn it and blah, blah, blah. And I'm just sitting there knowing I just looked at the contract and they didn't comply with a single one of the notice requirements for the change orders. They didn't comply with a single one of the dispute resolution procedures for unpaid change orders. And as a result of not complying with those terms in the contract, they had waived every single one of those claims. They had no case. And I had to sit there and tell that information to the owner in front of the project manager whose fault it was that the terms of the contract weren't complied with. So my answer to you is don't be that project manager. Wow. <laughs> don't be that owner, so, right? Don't be that owner. If you're the owner of a construction company, invest in your people. <laughs> Give them the training that they need oh, to help you win. I like, thank you for, I'm, I'm a storyteller and I've lived that actually. Well, I mean, as many project managers have where I feel on top of the world, like that guy or that, or that gal out there that, you know, highlights everything and says, we're owed X dollars. And I feel like, yeah. yes, I've done my job and we're going to fuck them and we're going to get our money. And yet yeah. you walk in there and you have to illuminate. How do you, first of all, I mean, how do you share that? I, I want to say, how do you share that with, well, you got an owner and a project manager in that space. How do you share that? Uh, well, in that particular case, um, I probably did it differently than, than I would do it now because I was so young and I was, I didn't really have much of a relationship with this client. The client had the relationship with the partner on the sure, file at the sure. time. I was really good. The intent of the meeting was for me to basically just go get the spreadsheet and have them walk me through it so I could bring it back to the office and we could use it to draft the complaint. Nobody realized this issue. So the way I approached it, uh, which was informed in part by probably a lack of self-confidence, I I, 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 I wanted to assume that I was wrong. So the way I approached it was I brought 
the copy of the contract with me. I had highlighted and, and post-it flagged the sections that were concerning to me. And I put it in front of both of them. And I said, okay, great. Your spreadsheet's great. I was looking at the contract in preparation for this meeting and I'm confused because this is what I'm seeing. So can you guys explain to me why this, why I'm wrong and why this didn't, why we didn't need to follow these procedures for these claims? Mm, okay, cool. <laughs> and that was a good approach. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think particularly because of my youth and my relative inexperience at the time, because I was, I was very deferential to their relative massive experience compared to me, right? Well, you so, were giving them some autonomy and trying to volley it back to them. So how do you flip it today? How would you approach today? Today, if it was a if it was a client that I've got that I've had a long standing relationship with, if it was one of my go to clients, I would just be really candid with them. And I well, first of all, you wouldn't get to that point because now you know better. That's exactly what I was going to say. First of all, we would probably not be in that situation yeah. because my long standing long term clients, we, as soon as there's a dispute or a, a disputed change order that's unpaid, they loot me in right away so that we are complying with all of the relevant. Bingo. <laughs> there it is, right? So. Yeah. I just I want to pull the handbrake here because this is huge, right? And pull the handbrake. I mean, I, I'm, now they're all electronic handbrakes. But you know, um, th there's a thing, folks, is that a couple of things show up for me. First of all, to the PMs out there, to the owners, everybody involved, the importance of reading that dispute resolution or the dispute procedures of the contract, and I actually wholeheartedly understand. And if you don't understand them, then volley it over to somebody like Megan to say, like, what does it actually mean? And now here's the other thing is, like, let's not let our changes build up, right? Because that's the easy thing to do that happens. All, ah, just, just, you know, we'll deal with the changes at the end. We all know what that means. That means you're going to get 10 cents on the dollar. Nobody's going to, everybody's going to feel like a piece of shit. You're never going to say that, that guy's a, an asshole. I don't want to work with him, him or her anymore. When... Listen, folks, I can proceed with this work order or this change. Help me to understand. This is what the this is what the clause says. How do you want to pivot? Like again, it's the proactiveness. It's, it's opening up different conversations. So I asked you a question like, what's one to three things? Like, I mean, I think this is the the biggest takeaway because this happens every single project. Well, just fucking the guys on site want to execute. So what they do? I don't know, send an email to the PM, get a work order, get a change order, get a, a change directive, right? Because technically a change directive is like, well, now you can proceed and you're up to whatever it is. Is it 80%, you know, or, or whatever the number is based on that contract, but you're going to, you, you know, a change directive means you're going to get up to 80% and everybody thinks like, oh yeah, yeah. So we're going to just overinflate the thing so we get our true cost. <laughs> and then guess what? That change directive is empty, meaningless anyways. So it's like, he pay the change directive or don't, I don't care. But now what we're doing is we're, we're, we're having human, human connections, conversations We're we're digging into to the context. We're learning. Yep. Oh, Megan, anything else you want to add? Like, that's awesome. Uh, thanks. I don't, I mean, I, Jonathan, I think, you know, I could talk about this all day. So don't ask me an open ended question. Like, is there anything else you want to add? Cause I'm like, okay, well, how long do you have? Well, well okay. So, 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 <laughs> I think I want to leave it at that story. I think that, I mean, that one, that one really touched me and inspired me because that's tangible. That's every construction professional out there. Uh, I don't care the job, the size, the magnitude that happens. And there's a blind trust and faith that occurs. Okay. You know, we're going to, we're going to, we're going to proceed in, in how many times you hear that, you know, in, 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 uh, you know, trust that the job's going to get done or in good faith. There's another one that's in good faith. We're going to proceed. You know what that means? Unless there's trust on the job it means nothing. And trust is the currency of every conversation without trust. Nothing else occurs and, and, and culture. And that's the work I want to do. That's the work I do. I don't want to get into that conversation now, except that. Well, the, the problem <laughs> though, if I could just, yeah, go on. Go Cause on. I'm aware, I'm aware of a situation right now for sure. another, I can't, um, the problem is that trust is only as good as what the trust is when you actually need it to matter. Ooh. So it's great that you might have a great trusting relationship today when you're making the decision like, okay, good faith, we'll deal, we'll do the work now. And we're going to trust that you'll take care of us at the end of this project when we need to, because we've got a good relationship. But what happens if that relationship sours between now and when it's time for you to actually try to get paid for those change orders? Because that, I, $21 million. I, I'm aware of, of, of a dispute right now that is $21 million because of this exact issue. The GC said to the sub, 
just do the work, we'll take care of it at the end. Just do the work, we'll take care of it at the end. Just do the work, we'll take care of it at the end. Well, the end of the project is here. And the GC is now saying, oh, uh, sorry, you didn't comply with the notice requirements. You were supposed to give us notice of all of these changes within three days of becoming aware of the changed conditions along the way. And you, and you had to do that in like a formal written document and it had to be delivered this particular way to this particular person. And you didn't do any of that. Sorry. Yeah. And then again, this comes back to the earlier part of the conversation where anxiety, stress, the cycle, people just want to, unfortunately, this cripples companies, this, I, 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 this, yeah. this costs people lives, truthfully. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And it's awful to say, and yet it's real. So I think that, again, I, I, I appreciate who you are as a human being. I love the work you're doing words. Listen, folks, I don't want to see you get to that situation. Educate yourself. Here's, and, 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 and it's one thing to say that, but you've actually taken actions to create platforms to holistically be inclusive of many folks out there to say, here it is. Do it yourself. Learn what you want to learn. Lean into me when you need to lean into me. But the biggest thing is like, look after yourself. Because if you don't look after you, nobody else will. You just identified again, $21 million, right? I don't care how big or small you are. $21 million is $21 million. Yeah. Right? That's crippling. So thank you. I, I'm curious, you know, you talk about um, all of this and then there's something exciting happening in Savannah in September. Uh, I see you light up about it. Tell us more about it, please. Okay. Can I, will you indulge me and let me tell you the origin story of how this happened? Absolutely. Okay. Cause that's my favorite part of this whole thing. Okay. So, um, I think, you know, this Jonathan, because we, uh, of our prior conversations, mm -hmm. but I just started getting active on LinkedIn at the beginning of this year when I decided that I was going to do this course mm -hmm. because I wanted to have a, a platform to be able to reach more construction leaders to say, you need to be thinking about proactive risk management. Here's a tool. Right. And so I, was invited to be a guest on my very first podcast. I think this was back in like February. Josh Hobby invited me to be on uh, on his podcast. And I was so nervous. And so we had a conversation before the podcast because I'd never done one before. So we were getting to know each other beforehand, prepping and all of that. And he lives in California as well, but he's in Southern California. I'm in Northern California. So we're, we're realistically about an eight or nine hour drive sure. from each other. But relatively speaking, in terms of the LinkedIn community, we're close, right? Yeah. So I said to Josh, I go like, Hey, it wouldn't it be great like if you're ever up in Northern California or next time I'm down in Southern California, we should actually meet up in in person. And you know, like remember in the before times before COVID when people used to actually meet in real life and and network and connect and he was like, "Yeah, we should definitely do that." And I go, "You know what we should do? What would be so great? We should like cuz there's this wonderful construction community on LinkedIn. They're so wonderful, they're so supportive. There's so many people out there that are all supporting each other and collaborating and they're wonderful. And I said, wouldn't it be cool if we just picked like a cool city and picked a weekend for everybody to just go to that city and we could all hang out in person? Like, mm -hmm. wouldn't that be cool? And Josh was like, yeah, that's a great idea. You should do that. And I was like, huh, okay, all right. And I just kind of put it in the back of my head. So then a few weeks later, I was having a coffee chat, a Zoom coffee chat with another um, very influential leader in the construction LinkedIn space. And I, I made the same offhanded comment. Hey, wouldn't it be cool if we like picked a city and everybody just came on the same weekend and we could all meet and hang out? Wouldn't that be cool? And he was like, yeah, you should do it. And I was like, okay, I'm getting like a little bit of buy-in. Mm -hmm. So I kind of was thinking about it. So then fast forward another couple of weeks later and uh, another person from LinkedIn that, I'm, uh, that I co-host my live stream with, Goose Dunham, was a guest on Josh Hobby's podcast. So I was listening to Goose's episode of Josh's podcast and all of a sudden, neither one of them prepared me for this, but I'm just listening to the playback as it's released on, you know, Apple podcasts and they start talking about it. And they're like, Hey, have you guys heard, have you, uh, have you heard about Megan? Is she's organizing this retreat, this conference? Have you heard about this? And I'm sitting there listening to this going like, what? what? Retreat? <laughs> okay. What wait, what, I'm doing a what now? So I was like, okay, well, I guess this is happening. So I, um, I sent out, uh, I, or I did a post on LinkedIn and I basically asked for people's feedback and I said, hey, are you interested in doing this and where do you want to go? And so people voted and they picked Savannah, Georgia. And so then I said, when do you guys want to go? Because of weather, because it's hot down there and all that stuff. And so everybody said like, let's do September, but let's do the end of September. So we picked the last weekend in September in Savannah. 
Then I asked them what format they wanted it to be. And so we're going to do a three-day weekend in Savannah starting Friday night to Sunday morning. Friday night is um, sort of optional. We're going to do a, a, one of those walking ghost tours of old Savannah. Um, and so that's just like, if you want to come and join us on that, come and join us. The official conferencing programming is all day Saturday. So you have to have a ticket for that. We rented um, a conference room at the Thompson Hyatt in Savannah, right by the river. And we're going to do, so we'll serve breakfast and lunch, and then we'll have coffee and snack breaks. And we're going to do a full day of icebreakers, networking, collaboration sessions. We're probably going to have some presentations, stuff like that. It's going to be super fun. And then Saturday night is also optional. We're going to do a riverboat dinner cruise for mm -hmm. anybody who wants to come and do that too. And then Sunday is sort of like schedule breakfast with anybody that you made a connection with and you want to continue to follow up on those conversations and collaboration opportunities. And so that's the plan, thanks to my dad, because I ended up roping my dad into being my event planner. So my dad's going to come too. So people are excited to get to meet my to meet my dad. So uh, it's going to be a good time. We are limiting the number of tickets because it's the first time I'm doing this and people love to like say they support it. But then when it comes time to actually showing up, yeah, people yeah. don't follow through as much. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. so uh, 25 total people, but that includes the sponsors and the organizers. So we were selling 20 tickets. I think we have a I think we have about half of those left. So uh if any if any of your listeners are interested in coming, don't wait because the tickets are gonna sell, they will sell out before September for sure. Awesome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for, for sharing all that. And are so, you gonna come, Jonathan? Uh, uh, you know, interestingly Put enough. You on the spot. <laughs> no, no. So this is this is um a, a gentleman, Brian, and I can't remember his last name. Oh. Hughes, probably, because yeah. he bought yes. a ticket recently. Yes. Yeah. You know, he yeah. reached out to me and, and said to me on LinkedIn, he's like, I'll see you in Savannah. And I'm like, refresh my memory. What the hell's going on? And I was like, holy <laughs> shit. And, and, and the answer is, yeah, Megan. And we're going to, you and I are going to talk more about this because there's, there's, there's actually a lot more there. Um, uh, and for the audience out there, be super succinct with this answer. If, if somebody says, hey, Megan, what's the one thing I'm going to get out of, out of attending? What do you want to leave them with? relationships relationships cool yep. so so it's like you don't know who you don't know until you do yep beautiful yep. uh thank you thank you for that 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 that's beautiful um we've talked a lot and i want to i, I want to really come full circle to this because this also you've talked who you are as a human being we've opened that way we've talked tremendously professionally about the work that you're up to and how miraculous it uh uh, the ideology philosophies you have. And I appreciate that. And something else that caught my attention that I think sums up in my mind, who you are as a human being is you talk about, um, and, and, and I'm not going to even lead this way. So I'm going to just volley it over to you. Um, excuse me over here. It's you dedicate your time to pro bono. You so see, you dedicate pro bono time, your own personal time, energy to protecting animals, uh, I'm litigating on behalf of animal. Is that, is that accurate? Can you tell me about, about that? Um, unfortunately I don't have the opportunity to do as much of that anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, I, it's unfortunate for me. It's fortunate for the animals because, um, the organization that, uh, sort of doles out those cases or presents volunteer attorneys with those opportunities, they don't have very many cases. So I'm taking that as a good sign. Well, so, yeah, what's a case, like what, what what's an animal litigation case? Um, so one that I did what that was particularly sad. So I'm gonna I'm gonna be very I'm gonna spare you many of the details. Thank you. But essentially, um, it was a horrific veterinary malpractice case for a bulldog um, who suffered extreme injuries as a result of negligent care at at a veterinary from a veterinarian. Got it. Got it, got it, got it, got it. So, so that really sums it up, you know. And yeah. and I don't think you, for me, you don't need to say anymore. That that really just paints a picture of who you are as a human being. Um, so so thank you for your kindness. Thank you for for extending your heart and your time and energy when able to do that because um, that's just that, that that's I'm, I'm not an animal person yet. I'm not a cruel person either, right? So that's where it makes a difference. All right, all right, all right. So, uh, you know, I don't want to leave on, on that note. I want to leave on a couple of fun notes. Um, 
talk to to our audience out there. What's a song that's been on your playlist? The song has been on repeat this year. You know, we're, we're we're six months into the year. What's a real popular song that's 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 been in your in your life this year? Oh, okay. So first of all, I don't listen to a ton of music, mm-hmm. not new music anyway. Yeah, I'm more of a yeah. podcast and audiobook person. Sure, sure. Um, and when I do listen to music, I'm a big classic rock girl. So my husband got me a record player for Mother's Day. Beautiful. Which has been super fun and my five year old loves it. And so he's super into Queen. So we've been listening to the Queen Greatest Hits Volume Two record on our record player. Pretty much on repeat. He loves like Radio Gaga, I think is probably his favorite song is. today. <laughs> well, I mean, there's such an inspirational song too that really, um, you know, just it's, it's, it, it evokes a whole ton of energy. Right? Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. And we dance and sing together and dance around the, the living room in the kitchen while we're cooking dinner and stuff like that. Of course, so it's been, I mean, it's been a really, it's been a really great gift. Well, it's been fun. You know, there's something special about record players, but even even Queen as, as, a, as a band, as a, as a group is just... Um, I love them. I think that they yeah. I, I, ahead of their time. Is that fair to say? Like just ins- oh, yeah. inspirational. Look at this. Mm-hmm. Decades later, we're still um, we're still tied in to, to to their music. So so thank you for that. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. Finish the following sentences. Construction needs more of. Ooh, so many answers. I'm gonna have to give that one some thought. Construction needs more. Or we can flip it less of, so more of or less of. Ooh, okay. I'm gonna go with the less of. Sure. Um, construction needs less turnover, and I think that we could remedy that by giving more uh, investment in our people. How so? What shows up for you when you say that? I think uh, again, from a leadership level down, I think the more that we are willing to invest in the sort of project managers, superintendents, foremen, and the field guys in terms of um, uh, professional improvement in terms of uh, meeting them where they are, in terms of um, being open to cultivating new, unique, and customized approaches to compensation plans that can uh, that can be tailored to what individual employees need to stay happy, healthy, and engaged. There it is, folks. Right? Like, give a shit about the people. Yeah, give, give a, a shit sh- about the people. Give a shit about the people. <laughs> Period. Absolutely. I, I we can't end any better than that. I mean, that that drives every single nerve and cell in my body. So thank you. It's been miraculous. This is uh, you know the the next of many endeavors together. I'm I'm honored to share space with you. So thank you for allowing me to carve out your carve out time together and and consume some of your day. And and thanks for letting us pivot through some technical glitches that we had. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you so much for having me. This has been so much fun. And I always love getting to spend time with you. Well, you're welcome. And you've left so much with me that I know is, is organically transferred down to our audience out there. Um, For those that are are sitting at the edge of their seat saying, holy shit, I want to know more about Megan. How do they, how do they connect with you? What's the best way? LinkedIn is a great way. Um, It's construction risk strategist is LinkedIn, but my name is Megan Shapiro, M-E-G-A-N-S-H-A-P-I-R-O. My website is another great way. That's got all my resources, my replays for all my live streams, podcasts, things like that. And it's the same. It's just MeganShapiro.com. Thank you for sharing that. And folks, don't need to write that down. We've got Vanessa in the background who captures all that. That'll be all in the show notes. Uh, Megan, honor, pleasure. Holy moly. Thank you for all this. Thank you. All right. This we'll, has been a good time. We'll stay connected. <laughs>